When she's done, can you just hit that stop button? I can. And it'll stop recording. I gotta go watch the kids. If she moves, you can move it too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Annie is back. Yeah, yeah, I'll just leave it. <laughs> and for the record, Ryan would cream me on a record. notes were scrambled, so I had these four tags in my book, and today are pink and blue. So, you got it? I was like, oh, that's so fitting. My tags match. Okay, so we're going to start on Genesis 1, 26 and 27. It said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. And after our, plural, likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Compound plurality, plurality. So Matthew says it, a compound plurality. So I'm gonna tell you guys where I see three witnesses. So I mentioned yesterday that there's the hotly contested 1 John 5, 7 and 8, and the scholars call it the Johannine comma. And it says there's three witnesses in heaven, but that it's a gloss. So in the manuscripts, it's actually taken from the margins. So there's that, um, that Trinitarians love, but usually doesn't get very far. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, um, the baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But, as you guys probably all know, the Greek doesn't have punctuation. So, some people will say that the period should be as follows. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son, period. And the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. To me, I think that's a bit clunky. And the thing is, is I don't know if it really does what they want it to do because then they're saying, and the Holy Spirit teaching them, right? So just a force teaching seems not quite straight to me. But hey, if you like clunky boots, you can fill them up. Okay, Luke 3, 21 and 22. In Yeshua's baptism, you have the Father up in heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You have the son in the water and the spirit descending bodily in bodily form as a dove. You have the benediction in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. It says, the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. John 14, 16. It says, and I will pray. This is Christ, Yahushua. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. So I will pray to the Father and give you another helper. And then there's concepts, okay? So it's kind of when we, when we say the Spirit is just a force, it's kind of weird because every time we think of a Spirit scripturally, it's always an entity, right? Like evil spirits, they're always an entity. So it seems actually kind of strange to when we get to the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden make it impersonal. And, um, and here's my premise. If you have a father and you have a son, you would have a mother. 
You have a mother. All right, all right. <laughs> There's the premise. Um, and you know what? It's interesting because it said, you know, it is not good for man to be alone. And then he takes out from Adam Eve, right? And when you look at other gods like Allah, and he's alone, right? And but we're in that image, and it's not good because how does love function alone, right? So to me, the concept of love makes sense when there's a communion, right? The function of glory, like self-glorification, like, you know, like if the Father just, you know, obey me, obey me, obey me, obey me, but how much, how much more receivable is that when the mother reinforces the father or the father reinforces the mother, right? And so when there's this union, these concepts start to kind of ring true and penetrate, like I think our intuition. So, Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm not going to touch on that, but it's interesting, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So it says there's one spirit. Revelation 5, 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Now this is probably not news to you guys, right? Because we know about the menorah, right? So in Isaiah uh, 11, 1 to 3, in the Masoretic texts, you get six qualities or six spirits, but in the Septuagint, you get seven. And it reads, And there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse. And this is just really cool. Who's the root of Jesse? Elusha. Who's the rod that comes out of Jesse? Yahusha. He is the root and offspring. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Okay. And a blossom shall come up from the root, and the spirit of God shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, godliness, and the fear of Yahuwah. So I got a little something for the moms. Every Shavuot, we make a little headband, and we always use red, yellow, and orange construction paper, and we make the seven flames, and we write the Septuagint version, the seven spirits, and we sing, this is free charge. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be filled with the spirit, walking in the spirit, be led by the spirit of Yah. Yeah, 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 filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, led by the Spirit of Yah. Just like a tasty banana, an apple or pear, your heart will bear fruit if the Spirit lives there. We're talking about wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, and knowledge, godliness, and fear of Yah. Yeah, 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 wisdom, <laughs> understanding, counsel, might, and knowledge, godliness, and fear of God. Uh, <laughs> create, right? 
They only know how to steal and copycat, right? And so counterfeits, at their best, they really are mimicry, right? So I say, you know, we have other pictures too. In Joseph's dream, you have the sun, the moon, and the stars, the father, the mother, the children. And I think it's all around us because we have it in electricity. You need a positive and a negative to get a charge, right? To bring life, you need polarity. I was listening. I've been auditing Matthew Nolan. <laughs> Double time, because I gotta make up her, you know, I gotta shove it in all these holes. So it's like always like blah 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 so, yes, and you even have it in, so you have electricity, you have it in animals, you can have it in lots of plants and insects. It's all around us. It's all around us. Okay, we're gonna go to Proverbs. Oh, yeah, let me tie this in. So there is um, a second verse, Genesis 5-2, that quotes back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the eight day Adam, but I'm just putting this on your radar. There's a theory, and at first, it could sound really enticing because they usually say, oh, this makes sense of Cain, because where did he go to build the city, and who was after him, right? But the scriptures say that Eve is the mother of us all. And this verse, I think, because it ties back to Genesis 1, the 1 and 5, 2, and if you keep reading, it's specifically that genealogy that it proves no Adam was on day 6. I believe that really does. So, and also, it, it also messes with gospel stuff, because in Romans 5, it says that um, sin came through one man, right? Just in the same way Messiah comes to all men. So, we can't be cutting people up. So, I'm just putting on your radar, the eighth day theory. Okay. Proverbs 8, 22. Yahuwah possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established. That word means to pour out, to pour, to offer, to cast. I have been established. I've been poured out from everlasting, along, forever. From the beginning, before there was an earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. Hebrew word there, hull. This is really interesting, because it says I was brought forth, and when I looked it up, and it said, the, the primary meaning was to twist or whirl. And ding, 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 I had read like, you know, about this doctrine. It also means travail or to be in anguish, which is kind of like a birthing thing, right? Um, but the primary meaning, the twist or twirl, this is factoid. The Eastern Orthodox, they have this teaching, it's called eternal generation. And they state the Father begets the Son, which is true, they got that right. The only begotten, the monogenes, the one of a kind, brought forth. And then they quote that the Spirit, um, the, the Father spirates the Spirit. And I always was like, what are they talking about? Like when I heard that, I was like, Spirates the spirit, okay, whatever that means. But then when I looked this up, all of a sudden it was like that light went on. I was like, I wonder if that's where they got this from. Like, you know, like when I was tripping out, like, you know, that, that, that lot that looked cool. I was like, yeah, it's like, it just keeps going. And then I was like, hey, um, it's probably a little bit wackadoodle, but I was tripping. Okay, so when there was no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While well, as yet he had not, had not made the earth of the fields or the primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Aaron, <laughs> When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters would not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman. And I love this, this master craftsman part, because Yahuwah is the creator of all different IQs, you know? And I think we kind of live in like an education is king society, but I've been very humbled by having six children, and they have different IQs. <laughs> And I actually have a very soft spot for those kind of kinesthetic, hands-on learners. 
And it's a different gifting, and it's and it's beautiful. And we need all types, right? It's very beautiful. And it's anyway. So the spirit is the master craftsman. Some people just do. They just they don't need a book. They just do. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. Sons, inclusive, sons of men. Rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my, oh, sorry, read that. Now therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Okay, this is just for fun. Exodus 35, 30 to 35. This is for the tactile people. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See Yahuwah has called my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge, and in the manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. He has put in the heart the ability to teach, in him and Aholiab, the son of Hisamach, the tribe of David, and he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver, of the designer, of the tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet. Wasn't I talking to you about that? Oscar? Blue, scarlet, the Freemasons, the Republic, the Democratic, and I was like, but they're stealing those colors, right? Yeah, okay, see, this is it. This is blue, purple, scarlet, fine fine linen, and the weaver. Weaver? Is John still here? John's gone. See? The weavers, filled with the spirit. Those who do every good work, those who design artistic work, works. So, yeah, we're made as creators. So cool. Okay, so back to this possessing, pouring out, travailing, whirl, whirling, twirling, spirating from forever. Okay, Hebrews 7, 9 to 10 says, even Levi who receives tithes, he paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Here we go. Even Levi who receives tithes, paid tithes, so Levi paid tithes before he was even born. Through Abraham, so to speak, for when, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So this is really cool because it, it proves like existing before you exist. Right? So like blueberries, you get blueberries. Eve was inside of Adam, was within, right? And, and out from Yahuwah, we're going to get to that um, El Shaddai, because I know kind of Matthew's been a bit talking about that, like to tearing the breast out, right? So, very interesting. So I was, um, I mentioned the Okanagan yesterday, and we were kind of in attendance up there when we were actually living up there before we traveled back to there. And there was the spearhead of the ministry, he had put out this paper on Proverbs 8. And... In it, his premise was that the personified wisdom was Yahusha, and that they had used the wrong pronouns, and they should have been male. Okay, but if you back up Proverbs like five, six, seven, you see that wisdom is being contrasted with an adulteress. She's being contrasted with a whore, and. Um, Kind of like, like Revelation does that too, right? With the um, harlot and the bride. And here's the nail in the coffin. Because if you roll back the tape to Proverbs 7, 4, it says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister. Ahuti. And that can't be mistaken. So it must be. Ahuti's brother, Ahuti is sister. So it must be female pronouns. And then it says, and call understanding your nearest kin. So some people say, well, this is just totally metaphoric. Because, like, what are you saying here? Like, now you have wisdom and understanding. So, like, actually, I have a friend that's, like, you know, it's, like, there's the father, the mother, the son, and all these daughters. 
like, you know, here's one of the texts, right? Because understanding is like the sister of wisdom. Okay, or because we know wisdom, understanding, counsel, might knowledge, wis understanding, wisdom, understanding, the nearest kid, it's like a parallelism, right? This is what I, this is how I read that. A parallelism. Okay, and yes, okay, Sophia, wisdom. And in, in Hebrew, it's Chakma, Greek is Sophia. So then I saw in this post, this thread I was reading, and somebody said, no, like in the, in the Brit, it had to be male pronouns because of this particular verse in John. And so I was like, okay, so I go check out this verse, and this is kind of, um, I ended up finding, like, I don't speak Greek, but I was like, okay, I gotta get to the bottom of this like pronoun thing. So there was a guy, he's called um, a Bible geek on YouTube, that's us. Anyways, he um, is, is a Greek teacher, okay? So I'm gonna start Romans 8.26. So the translators, this is just one example where they put he with the word autos, which can, which can technically be it, he, or she. They used he um, himself, but the noun that it's attached to in Greek is neuter. So in Greek, you have male, female, and neuter nouns. In Hebrew, you just have male and female. So if they were being technical with this verse, it would have had to read it, not he. But like maybe the idea is that, you know, with Proverbs 7, 4, how you have to like kind of reverse engineer all the female because you know it's a Huti sister. So you, people, people would argue if, if there's a place where you could kind of get a nail in the coffin, then you would know it's always he, right? So that's the argument with um, the John verse. But Romans 8.26 would read, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to pray, but the Spirit itself would be technical. But they put, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Okay, here is the big verse. In John 14 26 where they say this is the kingpin the only kingpin in the brain okay well there's one thing about it is it's actually not a regular pronoun it's a demonstrative pronoun and a demonstrative pronoun is used to point out specific things or people so this is when you get things like this that those okay and the word is ikinos it's not autos okay so if, if this was being translated technically, it would read, but the helper, now here's the thing too, helper in Greek is masculine. So they're bypassing, it says the helper, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's neuter, remember? So Holy Spirit's neuter, helper's masculine, so they're bypassing the neuter, and they're going to the masculine to attach the pronoun, which is actually a demonstrative pronoun, but they're gonna use it like a regular pronoun, and it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all things that I have said to you. But the thing too is, is if this was written in Hebrew, spirit is female. Ruach is a feminine noun. So depending on which noun you're attaching to, you could literally pick the neuter Greek, the feminine Hebrew, or the Greek masculine, okay? And we shouldn't be picking any of them, any of them, because we're using a demonstrative pronoun, not the regular pronoun. So it should read technically. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, that one will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Okay? Is that a little too much? We're good. We're following. Okay. Um. The other thing to note is that neuter nouns in Greek, they don't mean impersonal. So an example of that is in Ephesians 6, 4 with child. So the child is neuter, but it's actually a personal, it's a person. So neutered, neutered nouns do not equal impersonal. Gendered nouns do not equal personal because you also have like every single thing in these languages tables, chairs, inanimate objects are also gendered, okay? So it's kind of like pronouns don't really prove 
anything. That's kind of what it's like, okay? Um, now, there is a lady, her name's Wilda C. Gaffney, and I have not read her book, but it's called Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women on Torah and the throne. Now, her argument is that if you carefully read the Hebrew, it's the verbs that they always attach to the nouns that you'll see, um, if you read carefully, you'll see most, most often, and I have a list of her verses of verbs, too much to list, but most often they will use feminine verbs to describe the spirit. So again, I'd say this is somewhat subjective, but if you wanted to go here into verbs and nouns, there is a very plausible case, even persuasive case, for actually feminine winning the debate, okay? So this is just one example from her writing. It says, in the beginning, he, God, which is an inclusive noun, but it's masculine plural, created, so they used a, a masculine singular, because God was a masculine plural, they used a masculine verb to match the masculine noun, okay? He created the heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit, feminine noun, of God was hovering, feminine verb, over the face of the waters. So she, her case, she goes through, and it's on attaching feminine verbs to the proper nouns. So, do with it what you want. Um, also in that, I'm just going to tack on Luke 7, 34 to 35. It says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom, and this is a place in the Brit where they were like pretty good, it, it, like they did in Proverbs 8, it says, but wisdom is justified by her children. So wisdom is always depicted rightfully because of Proverbs 7, 4, as female. Hakma Sophia. Okay, and, oh yes. Now, this is another reason why I think it's a bit blurry, because, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I oft, how I oft wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. And who's speaking? Yahusha. Yahusha, but now Yahusha is using feminine, like, verbiage, right? So it's kind of like, to me, all of this that I just said is kind of not conclusive. But I say all that because this is when you start Thinking like this, these are the things that are kind of coming down your pike. Okay, so the impersonal thing, let's get to the qualities that personify the spirit. So the spirit, which remember spirits are entities. Spirit teaches and reminds, John 14, 26, 1 Corinthians 2, 13, and 1 John 2, 27. The spirit bears witness, John 15, 26, Romans 8.16, Acts 5.32, Hebrews 10.15, Jeremiah 31.31-34. The Ruach hears and speaks, Acts 10.19-20, and that's in first person. The Spirit speaks in first person. John 16.13-14, Acts 8.29. Oh, Acts 13.2, Acts 28.25, Isaiah 6.8-9, 2 Samuel 23.2-3. The spirit, the pneuma, makes decisions, Acts 15.28. The Ruach is grieved, Ephesians 4.30. Outraged, Hebrews 10.29. Lied to, Acts 5.3 and 4. Forbids speech and plans, Acts 16.6-7. Searches, reveals, comprehends, 1 Corinthians 2.10-11. The Spirit distributes gifts by will, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The Spirit helps, intercedes, and has a mind, Romans 8, 26 to 27. The Spirit can be blasphemed, Luke 12, 10, Isaiah 63, 10, Mark 3, 28 to 30, Matthew 12, 31 to 32. Those two are brackets, so they might be weak, weak socks, but hey. Okay, comforter, Acts 9, 31. Strength with power, Ephesians 3, 16, is the living water, John 7, 38 to 39. 
loves in Romans 15.30. Okay. Let's talk a little bit here about another function of the Spirit. This is... I didn't write the reference. Why didn't I write the reference? Keep you on your toes. He will also go before him in the Spirit and power. So see that Spirit and power? Distinction. Of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So I would just say too with that power thing, like just because you are a source of power or a conduit for power, that also doesn't, that doesn't, it's not equal with impersonal. That's like a logical fallacy. Okay. Um, okay, arguably, I know, you know, like we're all, our families are all very unique and maybe it's the father that's, you know, going for the hearts of children. But I think, you know, a woman often and arguably like, you know, if, if all things are working well and healthy and men are pr protecting and providing and women are at home with their children a lot, they really are the wooing of those children and the father, right? So, I am all, I am all. Okay, John 16, convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Same thing, okay, this is I am all, but like, I don't know about you, I do have my father's voice in my head, you know? There's actually a scripture about that. My son, keep your father's teachings and forget not, not you keep your father's commandments and forget not your mother's teachings, right? Bind them on your heart always, tie them around your neck, and they will talk with you. Okay, so of course we hear our father's voice too, but again, if you had the volume of time with your mother, right, in those young, they call them the wet cement years, right? So that that voice, don't you need that not more cookie? No more cookies for you guys. Too much sugar. Okay. All right, this is totally disjointed. Well, it's not totally disjointed. I'm gonna kind of try to, but I really like this passage, so I just like wrote it on the page. <laughs> Numbers 11.29. It says, Then Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all Yahuwah's people were prophets, and that Yahuwah would put his spirit upon them. This is so cool because there is a distinction corporately in the new covenant from the book of the law covenant. That corporate people, they didn't have the spirit poured out on them corporately. And this is just a good little um, proof text. Moses longing for the people to have the spirit poured on them. Okay. Let's go back here. Genesis 126. So, let us make man, blanket term, in our image and after our likeness, and let them, plural, who's that? Them. Adam and Eve. Let them have dominion. dominion. Okay. Dominion. What does this mean? Dominion. So I'm going to tie in Titus 2, 3 to 5. Older women, or elderly, elderly, right? As I said to Archie. Likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And I just finished telling Nina and Deborah how very blessed I am. I do have beautiful women in my life. Mothers, grandmothers, everything. But I love you, Mom. You know I love you. But I am very zealous for the word, and it is very exciting to see um, women ahead, you know. There's lots of women here that have been putting in years, years and years and years, and they have so much to offer, and we're, they're commissioned. They're commissioned, so this is not like baby boomer, you know, we put in our time and we're done. That's not really it, right? Have you guys ever noticed that? Because at all the thrift stores, they're all like 80 and up. <laughs> and I'm like, we are like the 60, 70 year old women, like volunteering. Anyway, I'm not saying you to be a thrift store, but this is a commission. This is a commission to teach the younger women and um, children, which is awesome. And train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their husbands, 
that the word of Yahuwah may not be reviled. So here's the thing. It says working at home. So are women allowed to not work at home? Like what does this have dominion? What is the sphere of influence that a woman is allowed to be in, right? So we've got the Proverbs 31 woman. She's out doing commerce, buying a field, planting a vineyard, right? But I always, I, I have said to my husband, because at first I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be Proverbs 31 woman, and I like, made a song, and I memorized the whole thing, I almost killed myself, and then I was like, she had like maid servants, dude. <laughs> you hire me some employees, and then I'll be Proverbs 31. Okay? <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> anyway, okay. So the thing is, is when you have different, like we all have different degrees of um, obligations in our home, right? If you have one kid, if you have 10 kids, if you're homeschooling or you're doing some kind of co-op or, you know, depending on what's going on. But I think the point is, is this is a primary position that can't be neglected, right? So because it says, you know, I don't know if it's this one, yeah, that the word may not be reviled, right, or blasphemed. So if something's falling off that table, then you're going to have to, you know, recalculate. And sometimes it's just a, a big, long season, right? It doesn't always have to be all at once. So that would be my take on working at home. Okay, it also, um, it says that Priscilla, along with Aquila and Paul, was a tent maker. It says that in Luke 8, 2 and 3, it says Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and Herod's household manager, who is that? Was they all had the means to sponsor the disciples. <coughs> so we we get the money. Okay. Um, something else I was thinking about, but I didn't really get down this rabbit hole, but I was just thinking about like the Industrial Revolution because I think that really changed the landscape of families and in the name of efficiency, right? And But like what cost, at what cost? Because it's like, I think they had a lot of home run businesses and families really moved together a lot better. I'm thinking that that's the case. Um, yeah, and another thing that's happened is the no-fault divorces which is really, really bad, because the family is supposed to be the welfare state, right? Like it says, you know, that if, if, the, if somebody has a family member, don't burden the church, the ecclesia, the curiacos, don't burden them, let the family take care of those needs, right? But even greater society, right, like the public sphere, that's not, we're supposed to be, and that the welfare state is ballooning, and not only is it so sad, like spiritually and emotionally, and like it's also just totally unsustainable. So, yeah. So um, I think we need to get faulted divorces back. So when we I asked that at the campfire the other night, Matthew was saying it has to be legit, like no handwritten ketuba thing. Like we need accountability, right? We need a lot of accountability, and we need accountability among believers because. It is like a wake when those things happen. We need accountability. Okay, so Genesis 2. We're going to do 18 to 25-ish. I'm going to skip some verses. but Okay, then Yahuwah said, it is not good, right? I said this already. It's not good that man should be alone, right? So we're in the image, and it's not good for the man to be alone. But I will make him a helper fit for him, the Azer in Hebrew, the helper, uh, parakletos in Greek, means to be summoned or called to one side or aid. So just a side note, this is referred to very, very regularly, the helper, to Yahuwah, and there's lots of passages where the Yahuwah is, in name, is referred to as the helper, our helper. And redeemer. Okay, we pick up at verse 20. The man gave names to all the livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So Yahuwah 
Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took, so remember, I was like, rib can mean side if you look it up, but then when I got to this verse, I was like, oh, because it says he took one, and the word one is there, he took one of his side, one of his, so I think rib's a pretty good guess, you know, unless you want like a big shark bite, or like a missing appendix, or like something like that. So I think a rib was a pretty good guess, and I, I can't remember, but I think there was something structural about the word, like, um, you know, like kind of like, Structure. Anyway, okay, and he closed up his flesh, and the rib that Yahuwah made ha, um, had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. 23, and the man said, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she's taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and they shall be they shall hold fast to his wife. They shall, and I look that up, it's, it's like literally shall be glued. They shall be glued. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both in their birthday suits and they were not ashamed. You can do it. You can do it. Okay. So I have a little visual for you. Blue. Pinky-ish, red. Okay, glued. I'm hoping this works. It was really weak glue. Okay. Uh, ouch. Yeah, it is ouch. And I think anyone that's gone through that knows you can't actually totally get it apart. You can't. So, just to make it stick. Who Yah has brought together that no man put asunder? Sorry, that stuff makes me feel so sick and sick. Have mercy on us, right? Have mercy. So Eve was brought forth from Adam. She was made from the same stuff. She was made from his stuff. She was made from humanness, right? And the children were made from the same stuff. And this is the mystery of the bride in Christ. We become partakers of the divine nature. It's so awesome. Okay, we're going to go to Genesis. And I'm tacking on verse 8 just because I love me some good ammo for them j dots. Okay? So, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of Yahuwah Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahuwah among the trees of the garden. So you ask, who were they hearing walking in the garden? Verse 14. And Yahuwah said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Side note. Psalms 119.25, and I actually think there's another one, but I couldn't find it. I was just writing this in this morning. David talks like that. He says, his soul clings to the dust of the earth. Just a little interesting thought. So, might not be the snake. Exactly. Okay. Um, on your belly you shall go, the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. So did she, would have she had pain in childbearing? It says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. 
I don't know what, how you get a baby out with no pain, but I will say, I mean, there's the epidural option. I don't recommend. But I will say, after birthing six children naturally, there is actually, um, you can actually just naturally overcome a tremendous amount of pain. And it's just called, and this is just, a, this is just like, whenever pain comes into your life, spiritual, physical, emotional, anything, if you fight it, you will feel it. But if you receive it, it's like therapy. It's like therapy. And I'm speaking from some experience. I have felt great pain. Okay? I'm allowed to say so. I did not think I would feel like this today. Okay. My little boy, you guys can pray for him. He has a fever. He was up all night. And... I was up a bit too, so just putting that on the table. Okay. Um, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In your pain you should bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary for your husband. Shall be contrary to your husband. Sorry, this is very faded. But he shall rule over you. So here's the next question. Is that the curse, the authority structure? Okay, so we just talked, we, your pain's gonna be multiplied. So there might have been pain, but now it's really bad, okay? So perhaps we're gonna keep moving through the passage. The authority was there, but now because of selfishness, the authority structure is difficult. So that's what I'm submitting. Not that it didn't pre-exist, but that it became difficult. Okay, we'll keep moving, and then we'll revisit that thought. And to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten the tree which I commanded you, sh you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now, you guys can check out in Genesis 8.21, in Noah's day, he told Noah, he said, I will no longer curse the earth for the sake of man. So, arguably, that land curse is lifted. That land curse. So, he, now, here's the thing. Okay, let's just keep reading this. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. We have thorns and thistles. So, it could be. It could be difficult, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of the face of you. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For... For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And this is where it says it. The man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And Yahuwah made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Okay, I'm going to pause here. So what I'm suggesting here is that they would have farmed. They would have had ba babies. There might have been some pain. You know, they... And what was the other one? The ground, they're, yeah, he's farming that pain of babies. What was the other one? Oh, and the structure between men and women, okay? But now because of sin, those things are just made difficult, okay? So it's not that the, those structures are bad, the farming or the structure of authority is bad, or that child labor is bad. It's just now they're being made difficult, okay? Because if you just read it, you can think that it's saying, that the curse is that he has authority over you, right? And I'm gonna say, eh, don't think so because of us being made in the image and how within who Yahuwah is, there's an order, okay? Okay, you get it? Got it? What I'm, I mean, don't agree, but just tracking, tracking, okay. Um, I'm gonna just read the end of this because it's interesting. Yahuwah said, Behold, the man is, has become like one of us, plural, knowing good and evil. I find this just interesting because there's that, always that question like, well, why did Adam sin? Like the whole free will thing, right? Like, why did Adam sin? Did he have a proclivity towards sin? If the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, like how does this work? And my understanding is just that they were undeveloped. 
Like they didn't know. It says now they be, now they know good and evil. And Yahuwah knows good and evil. Because it says they become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Right? So in their undeveloped nature, okay, that's what I would, that's my take. Um, now, lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree to eat, tree of life and eat and live forever. So if he hadn't eaten that, what if he lived forever? What if he lived forever if he hadn't eaten the tree of life? Or was he actually mortal? So in the day, when it says in the day that he eats of this, you shall surely die. If he's mortal because he needs to eat from the tree of life to live forever, then the death he died truly in that day was a spiritual death. Okay? So I, and I think he got them away from the tree because he didn't want them to be in the fallen state forever. Right? So I suggest that he was mortal. Okay, now, let's see. Therefore, Yahuwah sent them out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword and turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. we started. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14, but we're going to zoom in on verse 13 and 14 this time. So it says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. She is to remain quiet. Hesukia. She's to keep her peace. Why? For Adam was formed first. There's the order. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now, I would say that this first clause is answering that. She's to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And then I'm going to unpack the second part after. It says, and Adam was deceived, but the woman, I'm oh, sorry, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became the transgressor. Okay, so it calls Eve the deceived and the transgressor, but is that why... Is that, is that like a blanket thing for all women and men? And I'm going to say no, because, so that first part, I'm going to say it's the order. That is where we're getting the authority structure, is from the order. But this, for starters, Romans squarely puts the responsibility on Adam. The covenant, or the, the contract, the agreement, was between Yahuwah and Adam. So he is responsible. And so, you know, they say Eve was deceived, but Adam rebelled. Well, yeah, he did. He rebelled. And is rebellion better than deception? So is that why men get to be in authority? Because rebellion is better than deception? And just because Adam was rebellious, does that mean all men are going to choose to follow in his footsteps? I mean, we all have at this point. But is that like a sentence on your life? No, and it's not a sentence on a woman's life to be more deceived than a man either. Okay, we have lots of examples. Abigail, we, I mentioned her yesterday with her husband, uh, Nabal. Deborah, she was a long, good standing judge. Nothing was said ill of her. And she was deceived by fear, not, um, she was not deceived by fear, but Barak was deceived by fear. Hulda. She was sought by the righteous King Josiah. And they put Isaiah's wife here, but she was actually supposed to go on my prophet list. So, in case you didn't know, Isaiah's wife is a prophetess. Samson's mother, she was the choice vessel, even with Manoah's father. I mean, he was a believer, but the vessel chose was her, for whatever reason. Tamar, David's daughter, and she was the victim of her pervy brother, kind of bro. Um, Ma Matthew mentioned Judah and the other Tamar, who was more righteous. He said she was more righteous than I. 
You have Hadassah versus Haman, right? Uh, the noose motif. The book master makes me chuckle. <laughs> Anyways. Um, you had that quote, the great woman, the Shunammite, the Shunammite woman. She was a wife, but she was filled with the wisdom to do what she did. So we have um, lots of examples where, it, you know, you could say, you know, if it was like battle of the sexes, the woman won, you know? Or you could say so, you could say so. So it's not, so I really think this is to do with an order and it has to do with the image of who Yahuwah is. We are demonstrating an image. And there's an order within who Yahuwah is that we are displaying, right? Okay, we're gonna go back to also 1 Corinthians 14 and we're gonna, we're gonna dial in a bit on 33 and 36 this time. I'll read the whole passage. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So let your women keep silent, siago, right, keep one's peace, in the church, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law says. The law talks about the submissiveness. Remember, I didn't I covered not necessarily not speaking, but the submissiveness. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for the woman to speak in the ecclesia, the curiacles. I covered that all yesterday. 36. Or was it from you that the word of God came? No. Or are you the only one it has reached? No. The word did not originate with us. It came from Yahuwah through Adam to Eve. And so here's the thing is, greater authority, okay? The Father is greater than I. Greater authority does not equal greater value, right? Complementary roles being reflected in Yahuwah is, who Yahuwah is, is not demonstrating any lack of value in the Ruach, in the Son, in the Father, right? Um, they're all made of the same stuff. We're all made of the same stuff. The Ruach is mighty and reigning behind the scenes, quietly, not silently. Not throned, but playing second fiddle. And playing second fiddle actually takes great strength. It takes great humility. And most often, you are propping up and yielding you're yielding the limelight, right? You're yielding the, the seemingly, you know, the instant reward or whatever. But you're also being protected because you're not the, you're not responsible, ultimately, for when there's a conflict and somebody has to be the chef in the kitchen. So it's a blessing, it's a covering, and it's not a lack of strength. It's a beautiful thing. So, when I, hold on here, let me just see if I'm skipping anything good. Oh yes. So my conclusions here. Women can teach, they ought to teach youth and children. Um, they can have equal authority in the master bedroom. They can have equal authority in the public sphere, in courts, in commerce, but in ecclesiastical, places, we are demonstrating the image of who Yahuwah is, the spiritual component of our lives we're, we're demonstrating, and marriage is the utmost covenant of demonstration of who Yahuwah is. And so, So this kind of made me think about this whole situation you speaking here today, right? And I was thinking because I heard it said that Mr. Matthew, he's not a pastor. He's just sharing his thoughts. He's just 
sharing his, you know, he's just broadcasting his whatever, right? So this is like, you know, and then I start thinking, well, if that's the case, if this isn't like, you know, we're not really like the body, we're just kind of like, we're just like having like a public conference, you know, and like, you know, or, 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 is it that even if we don't want to be that, that we are? Are we just what we are? You know, an unsaid leader because the Spirit's upon you. And the Spirit has gifted you. And you are what you are. And the Spirit gives you vision. And people are needing, they want order. God is a God of order. And we've been burned and we've been hurt and we've learned tough lessons and we want to <coughs> abrogate and we want to hide or deke duck. But I don't think we can. I don't think we can. So when I got really ill this last couple of years, um, my son was 12, my 15 year old was 12 when it started. And he became a mother really fast. And he was so beautiful. Our family was in disorder. But it was so beautiful because Yahuwah uses ashes. He revives life from ashes. And he was making this beautiful thing in my home. And it was not what I would have imagined or picked. But it was so awesome. It was so awesome. Right? And as I got stronger and weaker and stronger and weaker, I had to reverse engineer. I had to start picking back up the pieces, taking my responsibilities back. Right, and lightening the load again, and then he'd see me go, and he would just do it again. I didn't say anything, I just did it. Wow. Beautiful. And here's the thing, we all have to be really brave, because we gotta do it again, and again. You know, the righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Right? And we gotta rise. And we gotta do it again. And we gotta be not afraid. And we gotta be smarter. We gotta be more strategic. And we gotta learn the lessons. But we cannot hide because his body wants to work. You know, for our body to work, you need all these amino acids, you need all these minerals, you need all these vitamins for it to work perfectly, to, for it to have vitality. There's all these components of synergistic, right? And everything has to be working. And the only way that's gonna work, it can't be what the model that's been handed to us that's totally diseased, where 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work and everyone's passive. Every function in the body has to be working. And when that doesn't happen, the head or the, you know, the face that represent gets really tired and burnt and wants to stay in bed or whatever. But it's like, you guys, we have to all work. And that means day in and day out, we have to be a living sacrifice because you don't show up here being what we need to be. You don't show up on Shabbat being what you need to be, unless you've been what you need to be, in every moment of every day, we have to walk in the spirit, right? I know this is not new, but this is my heart. And this is the heart of my message, is that we would operate in order, and that we would be full of vitality, and that all y'all men would slay the dragon and save the girl. <laughs> and that's all I have today. Hallelujah.